Good morning. This is the University of Kentucky Anesthesiology Resident Lecture for May 12, 2014 on the topic of neonatal resuscitation. My name is Julie Wasma. I'm one of the pediatric anesthesiology attendings. The first slide uh, included shows the neonatal resuscitation algorithm from the 2010 American Heart Association. We'll be referring um, to this algorithm and going through it in more depth in uh, the preceding slides, or excuse me, the subsequent slides. A key point throughout this algorithm to remember is that the most sensitive indicator of a successful response to each step of resuscitation is an increase in the patient's heart rate. So initial st steps that, that are included here include, uh, number one, temperature control. Traditional techniques that are thought of um, when you have a baby who's a term baby, some, a baby that you don't expect to have difficulties. Uh, traditional techniques include pre-warming the linen, drying and swaddling the baby, and placing the baby skin to skin with mother. For babies who are preterm, very low birth weight, or expected to have other difficulties, uh, it's important to pre-warm the delivery room to 26 degrees Celsius. Um, other options are inclu include covering the baby in plastic wrapping, placing the baby on an exothermic mattress, placing a baby under radiant heat, but it is important to remember to continue close temperature monitoring to avoid inadvertent hypothermia of the baby. Also stimulation of the baby and an other initial steps are included clearing the airway. Now when the amniotic fluid is clear, they recommend suctioning immediately following birth should be reserved for babies who have obvious obstruction to spontaneous breathing or who require positive pressure ventilation. However, when meconium is present, evaluate the baby. If the baby is vigorous, randomized control trials have demonstrated no value for the routine intubation and endotracheal suctioning. However, in a non-vigorous baby, it is recommended to intubate and then endotracheal suction the baby. However, if, if the attempted intubation is prolonged and or unsuccessful, bag mask ventilation should be considered, particularly if there is persistent bradycardia. You want to <coughs> remember to start positive pressure ventilations for either respirations that are gasping, labored breathing, or apnea, or any heart rate less than 100. And to remember that assessment of the heart rate should be done by auscultating the precordial pulse. When a pulse is detectable, palpation of the umbilical pulse can also provide a rapid estimate of the heart rate and is more accurate than palpation at other sites. Um, the next slide talks about assessment of oxygen need and administration of oxygen. You want to use a pulse oximeter, and it's recommended to attach the pulse oximeter to, to a preductal pre location, which would be the right upper extremity, usually the wrist or the medial surface of the palm, as seen in the figure. For supplemental oxygen, the goal is to achieve an SpO2 value in the interquatrial range of preductural saturations measured in healthy term babies following vaginal birth at sea level. That figure is included on the first slide uh, with the neonatal resuscitation algorithm, and I'll allow you to uh, look back at that at your own leisure. This, um, these goals may be achieved by initiating resuscitation with air or blended oxygen and titrating the oxygen to a goal SpO2 value. However, if the baby, baby is bradycardic, uh, a heart rate less than 60, with resuscitation using a lower oxygen concentration, you want to increase to your FiO2 to 100% until you have recovery of a normal heart rate. Next slide talks about ventilation. For assisted ventilation, you want a goal of rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute to promptly achieve or maintain a heart rate of greater than 100. Peak inflating pressures are variable and unpredictable in this population. 20 centimeters of water may be effective, but some babies might require greater than 30 to 40 centimeters of water. You want to use the minimal amount uh, of pressure to achieve an increase, an increase in heart rate. And always make sure that you can assess for chest wall movement 
um, of the baby, that the baby isn't covered with a, bl a blanket at, on the chest so that you can make sure to see whether you're providing adequate breaths. Um, <coughs> CPAP is also s sometimes used in this population, and it's been shown that spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress may be supported with CPAP or with intubation ventilation. And the most appropriate choice may be guided by local, local expertise or the culture of the, of the uh, hospital system. There's no evidence to support or refute the use of CPAP in the delivery room in the term baby with respiratory distress. Moving on to PEEP, it is likely to be beneficial and should be used if suitable equipment is available. And it's always, as always, it's always important to have an LMA available. This should be considered if face max ventilation is unsuccessful and tracheal intubation intubation is unsuccessful or not feasible. And I've included a figure showing LMA size with appropriate weights and cuff volumes for um, uh, different weight patients. You'll see that less than, there is an LMA size 1 for uh, patients that are less than 5 kilos, 1.5 for patients uh, 5 to 10 kilos, and so on. <coughs> Uh, for chest compressions, the indication is a heart rate less than 60 despite adequate ventilation. There are two techniques to deliver chest compressions. Um, you want to de first deliver to the lower third of the sternum, and a, the goal is a depth of one-third of the AP diameter of the chest. The two, there's, this figure shows the two methods on the top. Uh, figure A the, is the two thumb encircling hands method, um, where you have your two thumbs on the front, reaching around the back, and squeezing down with your thumbs. This is a, the recommended method. It's thought to, that it may generate higher systolic and coronary perfusion pressures. You could also use a two finger on the front with the other hand supporting the back method as shown in figure B. You want a goal of three to one ratio of compressions to ventilation, goal of 90 compressions and 30 breaths per minute, according to the um, American Heart Association. Moving down the algorithm, if you're still having a decreased heart rate less than 60 despite adequate ventilation and chest compressions, uh, <coughs> it recommends epinephrine. IV is, of course, the preferred route when available at a goal of 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 milligrams per kilo. If IV access is not available, you can administer uh, epinephrine via the endotracheal tube. At a, at a dose of 0.05 to 0.1 milligrams per kilo. The concentration that you want to use for either route is 1 to 10,000 or 0 0.1 milligrams per mil. There are also times where you need to administer volume. You consider uh, blood administration if blood loss is known or suspected, if the patient has pale skin, poor perfusions, weak pulse, or by history, you know that there has been bleeding. Also, if the heart rate is not responded adequately to your other resuscitative measures. For volume resuscitation, like we talked about, blood or isotonic crystalloid, typically starting at 10 milliliters per kilo, which may need to be re repeated. <coughs> Post-resuscitation care. Naloxone is not recommended as part of the initial resuscitative efforts. Heart rate and oxygen should be restored by supporting ventilation, uh, CPR, as we've already talked about, uh, but, but given uh, patient's history, naloxone might, may need to be considered. Also, once the baby is resuscitated, you want to consider starting glucose as soon as is practical after, recession, after resuscitation with the goal of avoiding hypoglycemia. At the uh, last few slides here, I've just tried to include some um, uh, other key points and helpful tables. Um, a question that uh, is often asked, what drugs can I give via the endotracheal tube? Um, and according to the American Heart Association, you can give uh, lidocaine, epinephrine, atropine, and naloxone, and just using the ac acronym LEAN to remember that. So for lidocaine, you want uh, the recommended dose is 2 to 3 milligrams per kilo. For epinephrine, um, as we already talked about, uh, the dose here, 0.1 milligrams per kilo. 
uh, atropine 0.04 to 0.06 milligrams per kilo. In naloxone, it does say actually other routes are preferred. They don't give a specific recommendation, but it is avail it is a drug you can give via the endotracheal tube. Another drug I wanted to talk about briefly uh, is prostaglandin. Um, this can be a life-saving drug, and it's indicated when, you, when it is needed to establish or maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus, basically to keep the ductus arteriosus uh, open for ductal-dependent circulations can be life-saving. Um, examples of ductal-dependent circulations are lesions where the lower body is supplied by right-to-left ductal flow. Examples include interrupted, interrupted aortic arch, critical aortic stenosis, or hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Also, lesions where the PDA is the sole provider of pulmonary blood, such as with pulmonary atresia, tricuspid atresia, or severe tetralogy of flow. Uh, all these ductal dependent circulations um, are, are all, of the, all of these are um, examples of ductal dependent circulations where prostaglandin may be life saving. Prostaglandin is not without side effects, however. Some of the adverse effects are apnea, systemic hypotension, increased risk of infection, leukocytosis, gastric outlet obstruction, or CNS irritability. On the next slide, uh, I included a table from uh, Cote, Table 8.2, which gives an e just an estimate of circulating blood volume in different patient populations. So for the preterm in infant, it's estimated that the blood volume is 100 milliliters per kilo. For a full-term neonate, 90 milliliters per kilo. For an infant, 80 milliliters per kilo. School-aged children, 75 milliliters per kilo. And adults, 70 milliliters per kilo. Uh, on the next slide is uh, also a table from Cote um, to give you a, a guide of expected effects of uh, blood transfusion uh, from blood transfusions in children. Uh, again, this is also from Cote. For packed red blood cells, when giving a dose of 10 to 15 milliliters per kilo, you can expect an increase in the patient's hemoglobin by 2 to 3. For platelets, when transfusing 5 to 10 milliliters per kilo, you, ex you can expect an increase in platelet count by 50,000 to 100,000. For FFP, when transfusing 10 to 15 milliliters per kilo, you can expect an increase in your factor levels by 15 to 20 percent. And for cryo, when giving 1 to 2 units per kilo, you can expect an increase in your fibrinogen by 60 to 100. The next slide I included was a slide uh, table from Smith's Anesthesia, Table 4.7. I include this, this dehydration assessment because I've seen that sometimes this appears on the boards. Um, looking to assess the severity of excuse me, the severity of dehydration in children from mild to moderate to severe. And we'll go over this briefly. With mild dehydration, you can expect about a 5% weight loss, a 50 milliliter per kilo fluid deficit. The vital signs can be normal, com com compensated by the patient, so normal pulse, blood pressure, and respiration. For infants they may, and older children, they may appear thirsty, restless, but alert. Skin turgor, anterior fontanelle, eyes are normal, mucous membranes are moist. Urine, expect uh, less than 2 milliliters per kilo per hour uh, with a specific gravity of 1.020. For moderate dehydration, you can expect a weight loss of approximately 10%, fluid deficit of up to 100 milliliters per kilo. For vital signs, the pulse may be increased or weak, blood pressure be, may be normal to low, and respirations can be deep. For general appearance in infants, you can ex expect them to be thirsty, restless, or allergic, or excuse me, lethargic, but arousable. Older children may be thirsty, alert, and have postural hypotension. Skin turgor decreased, anterior fontanelle and eyes sunken, mucous membranes dry, with a decrease in urine output to less than one milliliter per kilo per hour uh, with a higher specific gravity. In cases of severe dehydration, patients can lose up to 15% weight loss, have 
150 milliliters per kilo fluid deficit. For vital signs, the pulse may be greatly increased and feeble, blood pressure reduced and orthostatic, and respirations deep and rapid. Infants can appear drowsy to comatose, limp, cold and sweaty in a gray color. Older children are usually comatose, apprehensive, cyanotic and cold. Skin turgor greatly decreased, anterior fontanelle markedly depressed, eyes markedly sunken, and mucous membranes very dry, with an even greater decrease in urine flow to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilo per hour with an increased specific gravity. Again, this is, is a, a kind of a long table, but I do see that sometimes questions like this are on the exam, so I thought I would include this. Um, and last, uh, I included uh, an APGAR scale table because this sometimes also shows up on the exams. Um, again, this is a table that show that looks that is used to assess uh, a baby with five features being evaluated, heartbeat, breathing, muscle tone, refluxes and irritability, and skin color. For each feature, they're given zero to two points with a minimum score of zero and a maximum score of 10. Um, for heartbeat, zero point is none. One point is less than 100 beats per minute, and you get two points for greater than 100 beats per minute. Breathing, zero point when it's absent, one point for a regular shallow or gasping breath and a weak cry, and two points when you have full breaths and a strong cry. Her muscle tone, zero points when the baby is limp, one point for a weak baby with some movement, and two points for an actively moving baby with uh, a baby actively moving their arms and legs. For reflexes and irritability, you get zero points for no reflexes, one point for a grimace, and two points for cry or active avoidance. Skin color, zero points when the baby's pale or blue overall. One point when the baby's pale or blue in hands and the feet. And two points when the baby is completely pink. Again, just something uh, for, your, for your reference. All right, this is the completion of this uh, lecture. I appreciate uh, you listening. And if you need any or have any questions, please contact me at any time. Thank you.